Hi guys and welcome back to the Mighty Blues podcast. It is episode number five. I hope you all have had a fantastic, fantastic week. It is Friday. It is the second podcast episode of the week. I did promise a double podcast week this week, obviously because Everton played on Tuesday night. We are going to discuss that one all draw against Newcastle United in greater depth and detail in today's podcast. We're going to talk about the positives to take from that game. We're also going to talk about the fact that for 45 minutes it was absolutely horrendous but we took a point and ultimately it's a point that could be absolutely huge in the running till the end of the season I think if you'd have said to any Evertonian prior to that game on Tuesday night would you take a point coming out of it I think we would have all absolutely snatched your hand off for that and if you would have said that at half time I think everybody would have laughed at you because it felt like there was absolutely no chance Everton to come away from that game with anything at half time but thankfully we did um, and we have to take confidence from that, we have to take some momentum from that, and we have to ultimately take it into another absolutely huge game of football tomorrow, one for me that Everton simply must win. I know that phrase gets thrown about a lot in football recently, and... Um, I know it gets thrown about a lot when it comes to Everton because of how poor we've been over the last couple of years and how desperate every game of football we've played in seems to have felt. But this one for me is an absolute must win. There's no getting around it. Even the <clears throat> staunchest of Sean Dice supporters uh, wouldn't disagree for me on, on, on this one. Ultimately, we're coming up against the side that are in and around a similar position to us. Burnley, 19th in the Premier League, four wins, seven draws, 20 defeats on just 19 points which puts them seven points behind Everton and I think it's fair to say Burnley are probably one of the sides that are going to go down this season I personally think Burnley and Sheffield United are gone and I think it's that third space that is is up for discussion and up for debate and whether that's Luton whether that's Forest whether it's ourselves um you know we'll obviously have to wait and see come the end of the season but this is absolutely a game Everton have got to be winning none of this you know take a point because every point is is important at this time of the season no not for me at Goodison Park against a team that you know as I said are currently sitting 19th in the Premier League and the seven points behind Everton and, and given the season Everton have had you know points deductions coming out of our ears left right and centre and we haven't won a game for four months this is absolutely one we should be winning and I, I just I, I won't have any excuses if we don't personally for me and, and I know that might sound a little bit harsh and, and people might disagree but if I walk out to Goodison Park tomorrow and Everton haven't picked up three points I will be very 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 frustrated and very very upset with the team and the manager because um, you know you don't get many better opportunities opportunities than, than what we'll have tomorrow and a win tomorrow would be absolutely huge it would be absolutely huge to take four points out of the last two games when I think we all felt you know at, at the end of that Bournemouth game that <clears throat> things weren't looking like they were going to get any better anytime soon if we can flip that and and you know all of a sudden take four points from the two games that followed that Bournemouth game it would be absolutely huge and it would be massive um, you know in our fight for survival and it would be a huge huge step forward as well so we'll talk a little bit more about that game a little bit later on in the podcast there's also a couple of bits and bobs of information that we will go over regarding the potential takeover where we are with that whether it's any closer whether it's actually gonna happen and whether anybody actually really cares anymore because I I am getting to that point myself where, <clears throat> and I think I said this a couple of weeks ago with the takeover, I just want it to be over. I'm not even hugely concerned now about the concerns I have for 777. And that's worrying, isn't it? It's worrying when six months ago or five months ago, whenever it was that the takeover was first sort of brought to light and 777's name was first, you know, m properly mentioned with the potential of becoming the new Everton owners there was a lot of worry there was a lot of anxiety there was a lot of fear amongst their you know uh, because of their past and because of a lot of things we were reading in the media and a lot of news reports and um you know journalists coming out and saying various different things about 777 and you know the 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 way their businesses ran and the uh, and the way they do things and it, it all of a sudden felt like they it would be the worst thing in the world for them to take over at Everton Football Club and we should absolutely do everything we can to avoid it and what's happened over the last five or six months has not only have Everton been absolutely terrible on the pitch but off the pitch we've also had the points deductions we've also had the um <clears throat> the um profit and sustainability issues and whether we like it or not all of those things combined together 
you know, given the fact we've not won a Premier League game for four months, given the fact that we're in another relegation battle, given the fact that we've already had a points deduction this season and could quite possibly get another points deduction, uh, dependent on the results of the second charge, which, again, we're waiting to hear any time now from. It's almost made 777 seem... I don't want to see like a, 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 a better option than what we would have seen them as five or six months ago, but it's definitely lightened the blow, I think. It's definitely put people in a position where whilst, you know, six months ago everybody might have been absolutely anti-777 and it would be the worst thing to ever happen to the football club I personally and I can only speak on behalf of myself but I personally sit here today and just I just want it to be over with <clears throat> I just want the whole process to be over with I'm sick to the back teeth of hearing the same things week in week out and it's right and I'm not disagreeing with it and I'm not saying people are wrong and I'm not saying people shouldn't be saying it but I, I just I really struggle to get behind the whole who's going to sack the manager. There's nobody there to sack him. We haven't got any money to sack him. You can't just sack him if there's nobody there to make that decision. I really, really, really struggle with that. And it's not just because, I, you know, I've said I wanted the manager to be sacked or I, I don't believe the manager's good enough. I just think <clears throat> it, it, it's just every time I hear it said, and even though it may be true and even though it might be accurate, every time I hear it said, it, it just... It, it kills me a little bit inside because it just reminds me of the absolute state that this football club is in. That a manager, you know, now regardless whether you love Sean Dyche or, or, or you, you don't, regardless of whether you think Sean Dyche should be in a job or you think he should be out of a job, to think that a football club has gone four months without a win in the Premier League, one win in 12 games, which is, you know, our worst record in over 30 years now, and we haven't even got the option to sack the manager. I'm not saying that everybody should be on the same boat of wanting them gone, but I feel like we all should be on the same boat of feeling, uh, you know, shite that we haven't even got the option to, to make that happen, you know, when we're walking out of um, games of football that Everton have lost that we shouldn't have lost, and the manager's, you know, under pressure, and every conversation is, well, what's the point in even talking about it? Because there's nobody there to sack him. So for me... I just want the 777 stuff to be over now and, you know, every negative article I read, every negative bit of news and information out there I read, I just, it just makes me wish more and more that the whole situation was over. Even if it does mean 777 taking over, I just want to be in a position where we actually have a structure at this football club because <clears throat> we've spoken so much over the last couple of years about how poorly this football club has been run um, and how much of a disaster the previous board have been. And, and, then they, and they have, let's be absolutely honest here, Denise Barrett-Baxendale, Farhad Mashiri, Bill Kenwright, Grant Ingalls and whoever else was involved in that, in the running of the football club at that time have absolutely destroyed Everton, absolutely destroyed Everton and put us in a position that seems like we can't get out of. It seems like we are just circling the drain. It seems like it is just a matter of time before we drop. Um, and that is on the previous board, and that is completely the responsibility of the previous board. But, <clears throat> you know, when we all protested to get the board out <clears throat> last season and, you know, sometime the season before, and when we were all so vocal and adamant that these people were not the right people to take us forward and that we needed, you know, we needed them to be removed and replaced... I think we all had the thought and the idea that they would be replaced, not just removed, and then the club sort of just be left there to almost rot for 12 months, 18 months. You know, when I did that video, I specifically remember sitting in my car, you know, doing a video, I think I'd done it live on my phone, when the news was announced that Denise barrett Baxendale, Graham Sharp and... Um, <laughs> And Grant Ingalls would be leaving Everton Football Club. And I remember doing the video and I think I said something along the lines of finally, you know, a step in the right direction. Finally, a little bit of positivity. Let's go out there now and bring a CEO in who actually knows and understands the game and understands how to be successful in football in the modern day. Let's go and bring a finance expert in who doesn't put us in financial positions where we're facing points deductions. Let's go and bring X, Y and Z in. And since that happened... The club has just been left. It, it it reminds me of like, you know, when you watch those programs, Storage Wars, and, you know, people go to those lock storage units and there's, you know, things in there from 20, 30 years ago, antiques in there that have just ultimately been tossed aside, locked up and left. That's what Everton feels like to me at the moment. <clears throat> it feels like when the previous board was removed or <clears throat> when they removed themselves, whichever way it was, 
it felt at that point like Farad Mashedi just put us in a storage unit, locked it, and then you know sort of walked away and said, "I'll I'll entertain that when somebody wants to come and buy it off me." That's how it, it feels like. It feels like at that point he just gave up. He gave up really wanting to put things in place. He gave up wanting to make this football club a success. He gave up trying effectively, and. You know, I, again, I'm not here to debate what situation's worse, this one or the or, or the situation under you know the the previous ownership and 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 the previous board, but it definitely does feel at the moment like we are just being left to hang, um, and it's not good. It's really not good, and we need some structure. <coughs> we need some, um, <coughs> you know, we need ultimately a board that are able to make decisions. We need a board that are able to 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 be culpable and responsible for situations like this. Because I just find it absolutely baffling that a Premier League football club are in a position where their manager has not won a game in four months, and yet he his position is still absolutely completely secure because we literally have nobody at the football club to make the decision to sack him. I think that's baffling. I think that's absolutely baffling. And I think if any other, if we were watching this from the outside looking in, and this was any other football club, if this was Forest or Burnley or um, Brentford or Palace or Fulham or whoever it might be, we'd be sat here as Evertonians going, "Wow, they are in absolute." free fall how do they survive this how do they even stay up you know in this situation and that's very much how it feels like with Everton at the moment so uh, yeah anyway <coughs> we will <coughs> get in to the 777 stuff a little bit later on in the episode don't be worrying about that we will touch on it in greater detail but let's start with that point at St. James's Park on Tuesday because it was an absolutely huge, huge point, wasn't it? It was a massive result in the end. Not a great performance, it has to be said. <clears throat> but ultimately, I've said this before and I'll say it again, and I've said this to criticise Sean Dyche, so I'll now ultimately say it, not to defend him, but it, it certainly works in his defence, and that is results are paramount. At this point in the season, we are in a position, um, you know, as a football club, and we are in a point in the season where performances are, you know, effectively null and void. It's all about the results. I would much rather see Everton go out there in every game between now and the end of the season and put a terrible performance in, but win one nil, than I would see us go out there and put a great performance in, have 120 shots on target, and lose every week because ultimately, you know, it, it doesn't matter how well you perform. It doesn't, it doesn't stand for nothing if you walk off that pitch and you've lost that game of football so um it was a, a huge huge point and it was a point that I don't think many of us thought we would have gotten when we uh, walked into the stadium on on Tuesday night or you know when we, we flicked the television on to, to watch the game I don't think any of us were particularly confident that we'd come away from from it with anything and after watching the opening 45 minutes I've never been more confident that Everton won't come away with a result um it was one of the worst 45 minutes of football I've ever seen in in my life from from an Everton team it was so flat the players looked like they were just going through the motions it it, it felt like a a performance of a team that were bored of the manager's system were bored of the manager's tactics and were just going to stand on the pitch you know do a bit of running have a little bit of a goal but really there's no idea there's no tactic. There's no. There's no game plan. There's no approach to try and win the game. It's. It's all just sit back, don't concede, and try and hit them on the counter attack. But that doesn't work when you concede in the opening fifteen minutes of a game, because there's no plan B then. And that's ultimately my biggest issue with Sean Dyche. Is is it's not. It, I've said this before. The fact that we haven't won a game in. Um, four months the fact that we're now on our worst record in in 30 years um in, in terms of a winless run that isn't even the biggest worry I have with Sean Dice it's a huge worry of course it is and I think the manager's comments after the Bournemouth game of that you know the records don't matter and this that and the other I think that's absolutely nonsense in my opinion you are managing Everton Football Club we are one of the greatest football clubs this country has ever produced we have a fan base that prides itself on supporting one of the greatest football clubs this country has ever produced and to come out after breaking the record for being you know the the, the longest winless run in the in the club's recent history in 30 odd years and to come out and say that doesn't mean anything I, I just think that's a little bit distasteful and disrespectful and again I said this last week, I fear that the manager, because of the position he is in, 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 in the sense of that, 
he knows his job is pretty secure, at least until the summer, or at least until 777 walk through the door. He knows that he's not going anywhere. I feel like there just seems to be, and I'm not, I'm not saying this is the case, but I've just seen to have got a vibe from him in, 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 in certain moments, press conferences, match reactions, where it's just seemed a little bit complacent. It's just seemed a little bit like, well, yeah, you know, we'll just stick to doing the same thing every week. And it almost feels like he's thinking, well, I'm in a job here, so I'm going to take me time and, and, and do what I need to do and not rush it as opposed to, you know, because I'm, I think I'm going to get the sack because he knows ultimately he's not going to get the sack. Certainly not at the moment anyway. So um, <clears throat> I was... I was frustrated with them <clears throat> after Bournemouth for those comments because I thought they were poor. I thought they were poor. I thought, any, you, you know, you don't want a manager coming out and basically saying, yeah, you know, we're on the longest winless run in over 30 years, but that doesn't really matter. It, it, you know, don't worry about that. It's, it's, that's not what I wanted to hear. I wanted to hear them come out and say, yeah, it's an absolute disgrace for a football club like Everton to be on a run like this, but we're working hard and we're trying to improve it. You know, I didn't want them to come out and say that doesn't matter. But, um, <clears throat> yeah, like I said, again, I feel like this is a really, really difficult game to talk about this one because it, it, there's such a yin and yang, isn't there? There's such a there's such a sort of polar opposite emotional feeling for me for the, from this one because I thought we were terrible in the game. I did. I thought we were absolutely terrible. Now, don't get me wrong. I, I think we improved in the final 20 minutes, half an hour. I don't think it was a case of we were absolutely unbelievable in the second half i've seen some people uh <clears throat> on social media over the last couple of days who seem to think that for the entirety of the second half we were absolutely excellent I, I don't think that's the case i think for the first half we were horrific and i think for the opening 10 15 minutes of the second half we weren't much better when he made the changes when he brought andre gomez on when he you know ultimately brought chimiti on of course um dominic calvert lewin come on i thought i thought we we, we improved a lot at that point, and I thought the confidence of the team improved a lot, and I thought we <clears throat> we sort of, we had a go, which is not something we've seen a lot of from Everton in, in recent weeks and months. We've, we've very seldomly seen an Everton team actively have a go to try and win a game of football or, or try and get something out of a game of football. Very often we see Everton teams sit back, very sheepish under Sean Dyche, you know, hit on the counter-attack and don't make any defensive mistakes. But recently that's not been the case because A, we've not been able to hit on the counter-attack and B, we've been making silly defensive mistakes. So it was nice and it was refreshing to see an Everton team for once actually look like they were, you know, wanting to go and... um make something happen and, and, and wanting to try and get something out of the game and, and, and it felt it did feel opposite to the first half I'll be honest it did because like I said before the first half for me <clears throat> felt very much like the team were just walking around not 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 necessarily not giving a hundred percent but it seemed like they didn't really know what they were doing so they, you know they were having a go but for the most part off the ball it was a lot of walking it was a lot of I don't really know what, what I'm supposed to be doing here. And, and that's very much how it felt. Now, yes, the second half, as I said, the substitutions changed it. And <clears throat> I think the players picked themselves up a little bit and <clears throat> started to have a go and started to get at Newcastle and started to believe in themselves a little bit, which is um, which was huge for us because ultimately it, it gave us the opportunity to gain the penalty. Um, but, you know, like I said, I'm still not happy with the manager. And... Just because we scored an 86th minute penalty or whatever it was doesn't mean that I'm going to forget the previous 86 minutes and all of a sudden come out and start talking about how wonderful of a manager Sean Dice is because I'm just not quite sure he deserves huge amounts of credit for this for this result. I think he deserves credit for the changes, of course, because you know he made a couple of changes. I give him t to his due. I think he made them a lot earlier than he typically makes them. I think you're usually waiting until the 75th, sort of 80th minute for the manager to do anything, but he did make them a little bit more proactively this time. However, I don't think he made them. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm not quite sure he made a substitution until after. Newcastle's second goal had been disallowed now that might be wrong but that is a hugely important point because it's very easy to look and go well the manager made changes early at 1-0 we come out for half an hour we were we were we were you know good for half an hour I don't think we were very good I don't think we were unbelievable I don't think we were amazing but we were much much better than what we had been in that final half an hour and we managed to get a result out of it but up until those changes, which ultimately, I'm, I'm pretty sure they come after the um, 
after the disallowed goal, we were really, really, really poor and Newcastle could have been two or three nil up comfortably. And on another day, maybe with, you know, three or four of their players that are out injured back fit, maybe with a, a bit of a stronger squad, maybe they would have been two or three nil up, you know, with, with sort of half an hour to go and maybe it wouldn't have been a case of making a couple of changes and going and grabbing a point. Um I was concerned with the lineup again. I think the man what the manager seems to be doing at the moment is confusing a plan B with just plan A, but with Beto instead of Dominic Calvert Lewin. And I feel like that's what he's doing at the moment. Now, yes, he made a couple of other changes. He brought um Garner in, he obviously brought Mikelenko back in after he missed the Bournemouth game with an illness. And I think he made three or four changes to the side. And some people are saying, Well, what more do you want, Cam? He's making three or four changes. It's you know, you can't complain, that's what you've asked for. Yeah, I, fair enough, you know, he's made a couple of changes. I think bringing Garner Gay in was a was a good decision because I think Garner Gay offers you more in those opening sort of 60 minutes of a game than what James Garner does. I think he's tactically a, a, a better player than James Garner. He knows where he needs to be. He's able to break the play up. He's able to uh, win the ball back. He's able to, to kill the momentum of the opposition team. He's able to do all of that. But then when you get to that sort of 65, 70 minute stage, he starts to tire a little bit, which is natural. And then I think having somebody like James Garner coming off the bench uh, is, 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 is a much, um, <clears throat> I think that's a much, much, more sensible idea than the other way around. James Garner starting and, and then, you know, ultimately Garner Gay coming off the bench. I don't think it quite works in the um in the same way as, as if James Garner comes off the bench. And I actually thought James Garner did, did quite well when he came off the bench. I thought he, he he impressed me to be perfectly honest with you. So um so yeah, you know, as I've said, I think he got that right. Um I think he got I'm not quite I don't know whether he got the striking decision right, the the, the, the the forward decision, because there's a lot of people at the moment that are quite convinced that Beto is clearly the better striker than Dominic Calvert Lewin and that <coughs> pardon me, Beto should be in there week in, week out. I'm not quite sure I'm fully behind that. To be perfectly honest with you, I like Beto and I think he's in relatively decent form and I think he puts himself about and I think he's a nuisance and I think he's definitely because of his unorthodox nature, I think he's much more of a threat than what Dominic Calvert-Lewin is, I think Dom's easier to defend against than what Beto is, but I still don't think Beto's been absolutely unbelievable of recently, you know, don't get me wrong, he's popped up with a, with a couple of goals and he's 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 um, he's put a couple of performances in where he's had the go, he's ran round, he's worked hard, he's, he's, he's fought for the badge, but I don't think technically and, and as, a, as, a, as a footballer, don't think he's, you know, I don't think he's light and day better than Dominic Calvert Lewin, like some people seem to um, to be suggesting. But you know, again, I had no huge issue with Beto starting. My biggest issue was the system was the same, and that isn't really a change of plan for me. Changing three or four players in a, in in a team is 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 is. Is, is a difference, fair, and, you know, is, is what we've been asking for. And I do think it made a slight difference with, with as I said, Garner Gay being in there instead of James Garner. But it's not, it's not, it's not change, is it? It's not trying something different. It's not adapting the system or the, the style to try and go and surprise the opposition and get something out of the game. And it showed because, as I said, for the opening 50, 60 minutes, we were absolutely horrific. It wasn't like the three or four personnel changes made a real difference in the way we played or the performance we put in. You know, as I said, it was fresh legs and, and, and it, it allowed players like Dom and James Garner to come off the bench and, and impress from off the bench. But the performance for 60 minutes for me was absolutely horrific. Absolutely horrific. Um, and that is on the manager. Now, yes, his substitutions went well, fair play to him, but... I will still be absolutely furious if I sit here and pick my phone up this time tomorrow and I'm seeing the exact same system. You know, Jack Allison on the left, uh, McNeil on the right, or or other way round, sorry, vice versa. Dom up front, Takore, James Garner, Onana. Is he just going to revert back? Because is Garner Gay going to be able to play again? You know, just a few days later. 
after playing on Tuesday? Is, is he going to keep Beto in, even though Dom come on and scored? I think he'll start Dom tomorrow because I think that penalty will, will, will have done him the world of good confidence-wise. So are we just effectively going to be where we were two weeks ago? And that isn't change for me. That isn't doing something different. That isn't... isn't um. That isn't acknowledging that things aren't going well and thinking, do you know what, I'm going to change this to improve it. What that is doing is making a couple of personnel changes with players and then making a couple of personnel changes with players the next week. But ultimately, the system, the style, the instruction to the players still stays the same. And for that opening 45 minutes, the instruction to the players very clearly wasn't getting across because they didn't look like they had a clue what they were supposed to be doing. <clears throat> and <clears throat> the manager needs to be careful, <clears throat> because there is a world in which <clears throat> he thinks, oh, well, we got a point out of Newcastle on Wednesday, or on Tuesday, you know, and, and, and we managed to, you know, to get a point playing this way and with this system and with this style, so I'll do it again, on, uh, you know, tomorrow against Burnley. And he needs to be careful, because... You know, it's not beyond the realms of possibility that Burnley turn up at Goodison tomorrow and beat us. It's not. It's just not. I know people won't like that. And, you know, look, we've beaten them twice at Goodison this season. And, and, and I do have a little bit of confidence going into this game because I think the players should take a lot of confidence from the game um on Tuesday. But, in terms of the results on Tuesday, more so than the performance. But, you know, it, it, it doesn't mean that that the system worked or that, you know, the manager's uh, tactics and, and way of playing worked because, in my opinion, it, it absolutely didn't. It absolutely didn't. Um, As I said, he made the changes. You know, we go a goal down, firstly, in, in, in typical um effort and fashion, opening, what, 15, 20 minutes of the game. Alexander Isaac has it wide, cuts inside, beats a couple of the, the, the defenders and slots it beyond the goalkeeper and makes it 1-0. And I just remember sitting there watching, thinking, yep, yeah, this is game over. And it wasn't because we'd gone 1-0 down. It was because we looked absolutely horrific prior to the goal. And I know it, it come fairly early on, but nevertheless, we were completely off it. We couldn't get the ball. We couldn't keep the ball. We couldn't do anything with it. We looked absolutely horrific. And then after the goal, for the following half an hour, 40 minutes, we looked absolutely horrific. We couldn't keep the ball, uh, we couldn't do anything with it, players weren't particularly making runs in behind, whenever we had it, we gave it away stupidly, um, and they had chance after chance after chance after chance, they had the chance before they went 1-0 up, Harvey Barnes had the chance and Jordan Pickford had to make a really, really good save, and Jordan Pickford was absolutely phenomenal, by the way, absolutely phenomenal on um, on Tuesday night, he was brilliant, and he often is when he plays against Newcastle, there's this myth well, there's, there's a couple of myths. The Firstly, there's a myth that Jordan Pickford doesn't perform when he plays for Everton, which is absolutely nonsense because he is more than often absolutely fantastic man of the match performance when he plays for Everton. But there's another myth that he can't play against Newcastle. The pressure builds up and it gets to him and he makes mistakes, this, that and the other. I think in his last six appearances against Newcastle, he's put in six man of the match performances or something like that. And again, on Tuesday night, he was absolutely fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Some huge saves in huge moments. Kept his head. Didn't allow the crowd to get on his back. Didn't allow the crowd to affect him. Just did what he needed to do. Did his job and, and, and did it really well. And, um, you know, after his mistake against Bournemouth at the weekend, I think he was due a, a performance like that. And, and we were due seeing a performance like that from Jordan as well. So, yeah, I thought he was uh, he was very, very good. But, like I said, wasn't hugely impressed up until um, <coughs> up until the substitutions. And then I think the the injection of a little bit of energy from James Garner, obviously Dom coming on and, 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 and bringing that, you know, that, that different sort of style to Beto, a little bit more uh, orthodox than, than Beto is. Um, I think it, it, it did help. And, you know, ultimately... We got what was a huge, huge point, and we got a huge, huge point from a deserved penalty. Um, Ashley Young, you know, is ragged down in the box by Paul Dummy. I'm still absolutely buzzing with the title of my instant match reaction. By the way, um, I, I don't think it got the uh, the attention it deserved. Dom saves Dice after Dummy disaster is, you know, if if, if I'd have said that in year nine English. They're being given start of the week or whatever it is. That's an absolute corker of a title. I'll be perfectly honest with you. Um, but yeah, we got the penalty. Ball comes into the box. Dumb it completely rags uh, Ashley Young to the ground. And the biggest 
positive I can take from this isn't the fact that we got a penalty. Isn't the fact that we scored the penalty. It's how we got the penalty. Now, we saw Dominic Calvert-Lewin taken down against Bournemouth at the weekend in what was a blatant penalty. An absolute blatant penalty all day. I watched Manchester United get a penalty. Sorry, I watched Chelsea get a penalty last night in the last couple of minutes of their game against Manchester United. That was softer than the challenge on Dom. I think Man United maybe have got got a penalty in that game that was soft as well. I think there's a couple of penalties in that game that were, I know Chelsea got two, that were sort of borderline, maybe, maybe not. This one against Dominic Calvert-Lewin um in that Bournemouth game was as absolute light you know it was it, it was clear as day a penalty clear as day a penalty Garnacho got one the week before against us ironically and it was given without any even hesitation or any even look it wasn't given and I remember saying at the time <coughs> not that it's Dom's responsibility to do this because it's the referee's responsibility and it's the VAR's responsibility to ultimately make that decision and look at that and go, that's a penalty, so I'm going to give it. But we know that's not necessarily how it works in football anymore. We know that referees and officials and VAR and all of these people will ignore something if they think it's a difficult decision to make. You know, if, if 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 somebody goes down in the box and the referee looks at it and goes, oh, I'm not quite sure on that, and then the player who's gone down gets up and does an appeal and just walks away and cracks on, then the likelihood is it will be ignored and things will be moved on because the referee will look and go, and the VAR will look and go, well, the player didn't really appeal it, so there mustn't have been much in it. And really, and I, and I really do believe this, and I think I said this on Twitter after we had the penalty given to us against Newcastle, Really and truly, had Dominic Calvert-Lewin had have made the same force that Ashley Young made on Tuesday night, we would have gotten that penalty against Bournemouth. And I've got absolutely no problem in saying that because I, I, I believe it. I absolutely believe it. Had Dominic Calvert-Lewin had have got up, and I think I said this in my instant match reaction on the night of the Bournemouth game, had he have got up and got in the face of the referee and said, hang on a minute, no, that's a penalty. I've just been tripped in the box. That's absolutely a penalty. And got in the face and asked the question and prodded the referee. Like, by the way, every other Premier League player does. Every other Premier League player, when they feel like they've gone down, gets up, crowds their officials and makes sure it gets checked. Even if it ultimately doesn't get given, they make sure it gets checked for at least a couple of minutes and, 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 and you know, that the game sort of um, is, is stopped while that happens. Dom didn't. He got up and he, saw, he, he almost looked like he had that feeling of, we never get them, do we? So what's the point in moaning and having a go? I'm just going to get up and crack on and, and, and go and, you know, go and try and win the ball back or go and try and make something else happen. And you can't do that. You absolutely can't do that in this league. It's a doggy, you know, doggy dog world. And ultimately, <coughs> we moan, pardon. We moan every week. Evertonians about the decisions that we don't get, that other teams get. The penalties that we don't get given to us that other teams do. And don't get me wrong, I do think there's a huge element of of um of something else going on there. People may call it corruption, people may call it agendas, people may call it um, you know, certain referees not liking certain clubs. There's a hundred percent, one hundred percent referees out there that have got personal agendas against certain clubs, and when they referee those clubs, they don't give them a fair um, you know, a fair run of of the mill, a hundred percent. I'm not, I'm not asked what any of these nonsense clown referees say. Hundred percent, that's the case. However, you don't help yourself if you go down in the box, you feel like you've been challenged, and you just get up and get on with it. You know, you've got to get in the referee's face. You've got to have a go. You've got to make sure he knows that you absolutely were fouled in that box so that he can go to the the VAR and VAR can go. Actually, do you know what? I'm going to have a look at this because he seems pretty adamant that there's contact there, that's exactly what Ashley Young done, and fair play to Ashley Young, fair play to Ashley Young, Ashley Young gets some stick, I think we're all generally of the feeling that he shouldn't really be starting games of football for Everton at 38 years old in the Premier League, I think we're all of the feeling that he's not particularly been great this season, he's certainly not been good enough to have warranted the amount of game time he seems to get on the back of, you know, effectively being a 
a, a seasoned professional. I think there's other players in there that at times have, have deserved, um, you know, starts over him. But he has also had some games this season where he's put decent performances in, where he's, you know, kept the ball well, he's held the game up well, he's used his professionalism and he's used his experience to his advantage. Um, and fair play to him. I actually thought he, he played okay on Tuesday. To be honest with you, I, I thought he'd done well. Uh, you know, I remember seeing his name in the, in the team sheet when uh, when it was released and a lot of people were, were, were quite unhappy about it. And, and again, I'm, I'm not saying that they shouldn't have been and I'm not sitting here saying he should start every week now. But I do actually think he was okay on Tuesday. I do think his performance was, was relatively fine. Um, but... He, he absolutely deserves, whether you think he played well or not, he absolutely deserves huge, huge credit for that moment because it's a big, big moment and that is what you need. That is what we've been crying out for for so, so pardon me, so long. Players that are not afraid to get up and get in the referee's face. Players that are not afraid to chase an official down and say, hang on, you best not be looking at that, you know, because I've just been fouled in the box. Because as I've just said, I 100%, now you might disagree with this, but I am so, I passionately believe that if Dominic calvert would have done exactly what Ashley Young did on Tuesday against Bournemouth on Saturday, we would have got that penalty. And who knows what would have happened. We would, I think we would have been 1-0 up at that point. Or it would certainly have, it might have made it one all. Who knows what would have happened. That that might that would have been a huge moment that could have and, and probably would have changed the outcome of that game or certainly changed the way in which that game played out. You know, imagine that Everton keep it to one all and then Beto goes and scores in the last five minutes to make it 2-1. Do we then go on and concede again? Probably because we're Everton. But, you know, again, it would have been a completely different situation. So... Yeah, fair play to Ashley Young. Absolutely fair play to Ashley Young. You know, we need more of that and hopefully we see more of that, you know, between now and the end of the season. That's what I want to see. If Dobbs fouled tomorrow in the box, I want to see him getting up and chasing the referee down because ultimately you've got to play that. Every other team in the Premier League plays that game. Every other team in the Premier League uses that to their advantage. So why don't we? We've been Mr. Nice Guy for far too long, haven't we? We've been the team, the club that are happy for everyone to love, but not really passionate or sorry, not really ambitious, um, or you know, not really wanting to chase trophies. The mentality that was instilled in this football club by the previous board and the people that have been here at the football club for a number of years was to just be happy to be seen as nice people and you know, a, a decent football club, a lovable football club. Never a challenger, never a team that you know are, are going to disrupt, never a team that want to be fighting to win championships and are going to upset people in order to be successful. No, just the team that everyone likes and says, Oh, yeah, they're all right, and they're in their little place there. They don't, they won't disrupt us, they won't harm us, but they're all right. And I think that mentality has seeped into the football club at so many different levels, and I think it's seeped in on the pitch. And things like this is an example of why you can't be like that. If you feel like you've been fouled in the box, which Ashley Young did, and the referee doesn't give anything, you've got to chase him down and make sure that those VAR officials in Stockley Park are looking at it. Look what happened. Ashley Young did that. VAR looked at it. Referee had one more glance, and it was a it was a blatant penalty. It was an all day penalty that you won't you won't you won't find a football fan on the planet, including Newcastle fans, by the way, who are some of the most bitter football fans on the planet. You won't find one of them that thinks that's not a penalty. It's a penalty all day long, absolutely all day long. Um, Dom steps up, <clears throat> and he dispatches it brilliantly. He dispatches it absolutely brilliantly. Um, and yes, I know the goalkeeper got a touch on it. And I know some people are saying, how is it brilliant, Cam? It's not brilliant if the goalkeeper got a touch on it. Do you know what's brilliant about it? Is there was no long run-up. There was no skipping a jump. There was no trying to pass it into the back of the net. There was no trying to hit the absolute corner of the goal, risking hitting the post or it going out. There was no trying to be clever and penenka in it. There was no trying to hit the top in and put it left or right, which we've seen Dom do before, trying to hit the top in and, and blast it over the bar. There was none of that. It was just, I'm just going to run up to this and absolutely put my foot through it and rifle it. And seeing a good point made on social media afterwards, somebody said, it's very, very difficult to save a penalty that goes to the keeper's right and is hit with an immense amount of power at that height. It's much easier to, to save one going the other way, but 
very rarely and very seldomly the penalties that are hit with that much power at that angle at that side of the goal. Very rarely are them say are they saved. And if they are saved, it's wonderful, wonderful saves. And it's often because it's not being hit with enough power. What Dominic Calvert Lewin did is he made sure, right, I'm gonna get this on target and I'm gonna rifle it with that much power that if the goalkeeper does get a touch on it, he's not going to be able to do anything about it. It's just going to hit him and go in. And that's exactly what happened. And I don't think that's necessarily a bad penalty. Have I seen better penalties? Yes. Have I seen nicer penalties? Yes. And it, we, I'd love to sit here and go, what a penalty, cool head. Dom steps up, he penenkers it. But can you imagine the absolute fume if Dom had stepped up and tried to do something silly and missed? People wouldn't want him playing in an Everton shirt ever again. So, I don't care if it's hit the goalkeeper. What I cared about is in his head, he thought, I've not scored a goal in 23 appearances here, 16 Premier League appearances or 17, whatever it was. I just need to make sure this goes in. And the best way to do that is rifle your foot through it and get it on target. And if you go either side of the goalkeeper, more often than not, they've not really got a chance. Even if they do get a touch on it, they've not really got a chance. And that's exactly what happened. And um, I'm absolutely <clears throat> I'm made up for Dom. I'm absolutely made up for Dom because I think that will do him the world of good. Absolutely the world of good. You could tell that um you could tell that it was playing on him. You know, you could tell when he he done his post game interview at the end of the game and, and the interviewer said something along the lines of that's your first goal in twenty three appearances and he said, Oh, you don't have to tell me, I know how long it's been, etc. You can tell that it's been playing on his mind. Of course it is. Why wouldn't it be? He's a striker. His job is to score goals, his passion is to score goals. That's what He's, uh, you know, that's what ultimately he's, he's, he's there to do. And for him to go that long without doing that, it will have had an effect on him. Of course, it will have had an effect on him. And, and I think that penalty is a huge, huge, huge step forward. And, and, you know, if Dom can come out tomorrow and maybe get another goal, you know, again, which is very possible considering the opposition we're playing. No disrespect to Burnley, but again, we'll do him the world of good. And who knows, maybe he might go on and get another three or four. Maybe might go on and get another four or five before the end of the season, and that would be absolutely massive, wouldn't it? It would be absolutely massive for for, for Everton if he could do that. Um, so yeah, fantastic reaction from Ashley Young, and um, you know, as I said, I'm absolutely buzzing for Dominic Calvert Lewin. It was a it was a very well taken penalty in my opinion, and hopefully one that will give him a huge amount of confidence moving forward, and and hopefully, um, you know, we'll be able to see him hit the ball into the back of the net a few more times before the season is up. Um yeah, and then obviously as I said, we we sort of saw the game out then, didn't we? We we were able to manage it well. Um <clears throat> you know, there wasn't an awful lot that had happened in the sort of what four, five, six minutes that uh followed the the uh, equalizer, eighty eighth minute the penalty was scored. I think it was something like seven minutes added on or something, wasn't it? Um <clears throat> but yeah, a huge, huge point. Huge, huge point. And, and listen, as I said, I don't think the performance was particularly great. Um, I think for half an hour, we were much better. Still don't think we were great. I think we were much better. But let's be honest, it, it would have been difficult to get much worse than that opening 45 minutes. We were absolutely horrific. Um, but, you know, I've said this to criticise Sean Dyche, and I'll now say it to defend him. Performances at this stage in the season aren't as important as results. They're never really as important as results, but especially when you're in a relegation battle, you know, at the beginning of April, performances are secondary and results are primary. And to come away from St James's Park with a point, even given the, the you know all of the circumstances of the fact that we weren't very good, the fact that it was a you know a, a basically a last minute penalty, the fact that uh, Newcastle had a, loads of players out injured, even including all of that. It's still an absolutely fantastic, fantastic point and a point that could go a long, long, long way in Everton's um you know, in Everton's hunt for survival. We obviously don't know what's gonna happen with the second charge. We don't know whether there's another points reduction coming our way, but if there is, we're gonna need to pick as many points up as we can. Um and a point on, on Tuesday was 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 massive. Um and we need to use that as a confidence builder going into tomorrow because like I said, a point tomorrow isn't good enough by the way. It's not. It's not don't care what 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 any of the you know the biggest Sean Dice fans in the world seem to think a point tomorrow is not good enough. Everton have to come away with three points tomorrow. But the biggest positive outlook to to, to, to sort of have on this is that if Everton come away with three points tomorrow, which we absolutely have to and we should and there's no excuses to not, then that's four points out of the last two games. If you'd have said to me a full time 
in fact, if you'd have said to me when that ball bounced in off Seamus Coleman against Bournemouth, Everton going to pick up four points in the next two games, I'd have snatched your hand off for it with a big smile on my face. So, it's a huge, huge, huge opportunity to put us in a much, much better position tomorrow. Uh, let's talk about that game then. Burnley at Goodison Park, 19th in the Premier League, 31 uh, games played, four wins, seven draws, 20 losses, just the 19 points. They have been in better form of late. <clears throat> They've not been in great form but they've been in better form a one all draw with Wolves last time out at Turf Moor a two all draw with Chelsea at Stamford Bridge with 10 men as well which was a big result to them last weekend the win against Brentford prior to that 2-1 a two all draw with West Ham United as well the last time Burnley actually lost a game of football it was the second, sorry, the third of March, a two 0 defeat at home to Bournemouth. Since then, they've drawn two all away with West Ham. They've beaten Brentford at home two one. They've drawn two all away with Chelsea, and they've drawn one all at home with Wolves. So you know they're unbeaten in a month, just over a month effectively, which is you know the the polar opposite to Everton's form and where Everton are at the moment. And it won't be an easy game. This it absolutely won't be an easy game. As I said, for me personally, and this is no disrespect to Burnley, um, but I just feel like it will be one step too far. I think when people talk about the relegation battle in the Premier League, it's funny because often I think people seem to get confused that there's three teams that go down. It's not just one team. And I've seen a couple of people of late talking about the potential of Burnley surviving. And, and listen, maybe they will. They, they could go on an absolutely unbelievable run between now and the end of the season and, and manage to do it. But it would be an absolute miracle at this stage. And it's not just to slag Burnley off because we're playing them tomorrow. And trust me, if there's any Burnley fans watching, I'm well aware that there's a big possibility you could turn up Goodison tomorrow and beat us because A, we're absolutely terrible at Goodison and B, we're not in very good form at the moment. Um, but three teams are relegated and personally, I just don't feel like Burnley and Sheffield United will get out of it. I think Luton potentially may. Uh, you know, Forrest may get dragged into it. We may get dragged into it, but I, I just don't think, Bay I think Burnley and, and, and Sheffield United are too far gone. It would take a miracle for either of those two teams to stay up at this point. Um, and I'm not sure that that will happen. That's not saying that they haven't got a chance of winning at Goodison Park tomorrow because they absolutely have, because Luton have won twice at Goodison Park this season. Uh, and we are absolutely terrible. Having said that, we have beaten Burnley twice this season. We beat them at Goodison, obviously, in the Cup, in the early rounds of the Cup. Very convincing, comfortable win. And we beat them away from home in December as well. Our last Premier League win was against Burnley, which tells you everything you need to know really we could be in a position tomorrow where Sean Dyche ex Burnley manager's last win in the Premier League was four months ago against this former club and potentially his next win in the Premier League hopefully will be against this former club as well uh, they've got some decent players Burnley uh, the likes of David Fafana who I think has done well since he's come in on loan James Safford uh, who obviously is a, a young up and coming goalkeeper you know experienced players like Nathan Redmond in there Adam Ramsey who's uh, played there for, for a number of years now um, and they've got some young talented players that are maybe not quite ready for the Premier League yet but in years to come you know very possibly could be um, you know good decent Premier League players um, obviously they've got the likes of Sander Berge in there from Sheffield United <coughs> Patino in there as well they've got a young squad Burnley and that's what um, <coughs> That's what Vincent Company has tried to build, hasn't he? He's tried to build a young squad. He's tried to build a squad full of players that, you know, we can nurture and build and, and get to a position where ultimately, you know, they're, they're capable of, of competing in the league. Unfortunately for Burnley, I'm not quite sure they're at that position yet, but that's not to say that they won't come back up and, and, and in a couple of years be, be much more prepared to sort of battle in the uh, division. Listen, this will be tough tomorrow. It will be absolutely tough because of the pressure on it and because of the intensity on it. I'm I I'm I'm happy we got a point against Newcastle, not only because it's a point and that is, could potentially be a huge, huge point in, in, in our hunt for survival, but also because I can't even begin to imagine what Goodison would have been like tomorrow had we have come off the back of two defeats. I think the pressure and the expectation would have just been immeasurable for the players. And I think that's when the players feel it the most. And that's when the players are more capable, or sorry, more likely to put in a poor performance is when that pressure is absolutely on them. Um, I still think it will be on them tomorrow, and as it should be, <clears throat> because ultimately, 
you know, there's, there's expectation, and and, and 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 I know this may seem a little bit harsh, and I don't mean it in an offensive way, but my expectation is that Everton can turn up and be Burnley at Goodison Park tomorrow, it simply is, and as I said, for me, you know, the, the phrase gets bandied about a lot, and I've, I've had stick before on this channel for saying the thing, you know, games are must-wins when people haven't agreed with it, but if you don't think playing Burnley, who currently are one of the teams that sit below us in, in the Premier League and one of the teams that arguably have been worse than Everton in the Premier League this season, and there's not many of them, if you don't expect Everton and believe Everton beating Burnley at Goodison Park on the 5th of April, given we're in a relegation battle pending a potential other point deduction, isn't a must-win, if you don't think this game is a must-win, then I'm not really sure what to tell you. I'm not really sure what to say. I know people don't like that phrase because it adds unnecessary pressure and this and that and the other, but it doesn't really add unnecessary pressure. What adds unnecessary pressure is going four months without a Premier League win. What adds unnecessary pressure is doing the same thing week in, week out, expecting a different result and creating a frustration amongst the fan base because the, nothing is being changed. That's what adds unnecessary pressure. Expecting to beat a team in the relegation zone in the middle of April when we ourselves are in the potential of dropping into a relegation zone at Goodison Park isn't isn't added pressure. It's an expectation that Everton absolutely should be meeting. And I'm not disrespecting Burnley and, and, and trust me, if there's any Burnley fans watching thinking, ha ha, can't wait to wipe it in his face when if we beat them tomorrow, trust me, there's probably not an Evertonian on the planet that believes that the, 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 that there is a, a huge probability or huge possibility, not probability, huge possibility that Burnley could come away with something tomorrow at Goodison Park. Absolutely. I've watched Everton for 25 years. I'm not stupid enough to think that that's not the case. However, it doesn't take away from the importance of this game. Everton have got to go out and win this game. We absolutely have got to go out and win this game. Um, now, whether that's a change of system, whether the manager uses the same system, probably will because let's be honest he's not changed it to, the, to date so why would he change it now um <clears throat> but he runs a huge risk by doing that because if he doesn't change the system and we go out and we lose the game or we don't win the game then i think his position becomes untenable as manager even though there's no one to sack him and there's no money to sack him and this that and the other i i, I don't think his position as manager is tenable anymore if ever if Everton were to lose tomorrow as specifically um but let's not talk about that. Let's talk about positives. We've got a huge, huge point there on Tuesday night against a good side, a side that are fighting for Europe, a side that we've now taken four points from this season, which is massive, absolutely massive. The way in which we did it, I think, allows us to take confidence into this game tomorrow. There's this misconception with football, and I've seen a lot of Newcastle fans talking about this over the last few days, and I think it's laughable, and I think it's quite an immature way of looking at things when it comes to football, and it's this whole, ah, why are you celebrating, you've got battered, you got a last minute point in the game, you snatched the point with a penalty, how are you happy with that, that's embarrassing, look at the levels, I think that's the biggest load of nonsense in the world, I think you are more likely to have a positive reaction <clears throat> in the following game, if you have managed to grab a point late on when you're in bad form and things aren't going quite well for you at the minute and you're you four months without a win like we are, if you manage to grab a point late on in a game away from home against a team fighting for Europe, I would argue that that gives more confidence and more momentum and, and more of a fucking hell boys come out, let's wake up now, we can get we can get at this, than what it would have been if we'd have battered Newcastle, been winning 1-0 from the 10th minute onwards, and then conceded in the last minute, like we did against Brighton. I think those players take more confidence from that point against Newcastle on Tuesday than they would have done from the point against Brighton. Because in the Brighton game, we worked so hard, we battled so much, you know, we were deservedly in front, the performance was 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 very good. And then we concede in the last seconds to, 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 to drop points. You know, that gut-wrenching kick in the stomach sort of, oh. Whereas Tuesday, it was the complete opposite. Yes, for, you know, 70, 80 minutes, we were all absolutely fuming, thinking we were going to lose again. But the minute we scored that penalty, we were buzzing. There's videos of Evertonians in Newcastle City Centre at 4 o'clock the next morning, you know, singing chants and on the coaches on the way home and in the service stations. The atmosphere was much better. The feeling is much better. And I think we need to use that to our advantage tomorrow. And if we go and win tomorrow, I think 
uh, again, I think the atmosphere will, will will increase again, and the feeling will increase again, and that will help us, um, you know, in the in the coming weeks. Um, but yeah, for me, I'm no nonsense with stuff like this. I'm absolutely no nonsense, you know. Uh, again, I'm I'm not really I don't really pay attention to the don't add unnecessary pressure. No, this is a must win game, and if Everton don't win tomorrow, it's a fucking disgrace. And that's not because to disrespect Burnley or say Burnley are terrible or whatever. I wouldn't be surprised if we didn't win tomorrow. But doesn't mean I wouldn't be fuming just because I wouldn't be surprised. It's a huge, huge game and it's one that Everton have got to take advantage of. And that point, and we've got to use and zone in on that energy that we all felt when Dominic Calvert-Lewin blasted that penalty in and that we all felt at full time and use that to our advantage tomorrow. Absolutely, we've got to do that. Uh, anyway, let's... Um Let's round up with some reports from the last couple of hours or so from Paul Joyce regarding the takeover. Paul Joyce, very reputable source, of course. He has reported that 777 Partners bullishly maintains it will repay the 158 million stadium loan split between MSP Sports, local businessman George Downing and Andy Bell. Uh, he also says dialogue has continued this week between 777 and the Premier League, but the authorities are still not fully satisfied that everything think is on course for a change of ownership at Everton. He then goes on to say an unnamed American group are interested in buying Everton. The group have no sport and background, but it is believed to be cash rich. However, they currently remain in the shadows. Who does that sound like? Who does that? What what does that sentence sound like? I'm not even going to give you the answer and I'm going to see how many people get the answer in the comments. What does that sentence sound like? The group have no sporting background, but it is believed to be cash rich however they currently remain in the shadows yeah i'm not quite sure that is um that is 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 the most sensible thing in the world that screams we don't know what we're doing but we've got loads of money when we've just had a fella who didn't know what he was doing but had loads of money and look at the situation winning now um but yeah who knows who knows look as i said i i i, I maintain my point whether I read an article that says 777 are the best thing in the world and they'll be the best owners Everton have ever had and Everton will win 100 Champions Leagues under them, or whether I read something saying, don't go near 777, they're absolutely terrible, it'd be the worst thing to ever happen to your football club. Regardless of what I read, I, at, I'm at this point now of just wanting it to be over. I just want it to be done. I just want it to be over so we can move on and we can focus what we all grew up loving. You know, when we, when we were wearing an Everton shirt as a kid, playing football in the park with our mates or going to school or playing in the street when we were going to Goodison every week, you know, when we were wanting the new kit, when it was come out or, you know, our favourite player's name on the back, we were wanting a programme, we were watching, a, we were wanting a pin badge, we were wanting a scarf, we were wanting to go away on those European games when we were kids or wanting to go away to Wembley, you know, the, the odd couple of times we got there. We never were wanting to do that because we love the owner of the football club. No, we wanted to do that because we loved the team, we loved the players, we loved watching this team. Let's just get back to that. I'm fucking bored of talking about finances and ownership and documents and FFP. I'm bored of it. Let's just get back to enjoying 48. So, there you go. We're going to leave it there. If you have enjoyed this one, please, please do leave a like. We will be back with an instant match reaction tomorrow after that Burnley game. So, look out for that one. And then, of course, we'll be back next week with another full-length pod. Big, big thank you all for watching. Really, really do appreciate all the support. If you've enjoyed it, please do leave a like. If you are new to the channel, don't forget to subscribe as well. Big, big thank you all. And we'll see you soon.